Welcome again, dear friends of the Urban Theological Institute. I'm Dr. Guy Irwin, President of United Lutheran Seminary, and I'm happy to introduce again the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley of the Alfred Street Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. Dr. Wesley started us off with a powerful lecture. Now he will bring us the good news of the gospel in an equally inspired way, reflecting on the good trouble to which our faith calls us. In this year in which we lost Congressman John Lewis, it is doubly important to reflect on his words and his example and be ourselves prepared to go where God leads us for our neighbor's sake. For love of God and neighbor is that for which we have been made. Welcome, and to those who were with us yesterday, welcome back to the 40th anniversary celebration of the Urban Theological Institute. UTI was founded here, United Lutheran Seminary on our Philadelphia campus in 1980 by the late Reverend Dr. Randolph Jones, a United Methodist minister, and the late Reverend Dr. Andrew Willis, a bishop in the Church of God in Christ. Now, because of COVID-19, we are not meeting at Grace Baptist Church of Germantown, where we would have met and would have been able to at least accommodate over 600 people. But instead, we are accommodating thousands online as you watch and celebrate with us. I want to welcome you on behalf of our president, the Reverend Dr. R. Guy Irwin, Utica, that is the Committee of Advisors for the UTI, both our past and present members, our entire seminary community, both students and alumni, staff and faculty, and my colleague on the faculty, Jeremiah A. Wright, Associate Professor of Homiletics and Liturgics in African American Studies, the Reverend Dr. Wayne E. Croft. As you prepare to listen, you may be touched and moved to help us as we raise funds for the chair in African American Studies. We are close to a million dollars and we are trying to raise two million for that chair. And so if you would like to send a check in, of course, you can make the check payable to United Lutheran Seminary. Mail it here, attention UTI office, 7301 Germantown Avenue, Philadelphia, PA, 19119. Or as they show online, you can give online at uls.edu backward slash give and you choose the Jeremiah A. Wright Senior Endowed Chair, make your contribution or you can text to give. And then as a form of announcement, I want to invite you back on Friday evening to relax with us with a 40 minute concert, piano concert, as we celebrate 40 years with Maestro Scott Cumberbatch. To whet your appetite for him, he will give a piano sermonic solo just before the sermon on this evening. So now that you're ready to hear the word of God and you were challenged on yesterday by Dr. Wesley's uh, presentation and his lecture, let me again present him as the 40th anniversary preacher. The Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley is the exciting, gifted and anointed pastor of the historic Alfred Street Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia with more than 10,000 members and a viewership online monthly of more than 50,000. Dr. Wesley earned his undergraduate degree from Duke University. He earned his master's degree from Boston University School of Theology, his doctor of ministry degree from Northern Baptist Seminary, and he is currently working on his PhD in African-American preaching and sacred rhetoric at Christian Theological Seminary. Again, Dr. Wesley is regarded as one of the most prolific and prophetic voices of justice and grace in our generation. His sermon, When the Bird of Hurt, was acknowledged in Time Magazine July 29, 2013 cover story after Trayvon as one of the best sermons preached in the United States following a not guilty verdict for George Zimmerman. Three of his sermons have been archived in the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. Now, there's much that I can say about you, but I want you to sit back, listen to Scott Cumberbatch as he plays and prepares our hearts to receive this message entitled Good Trouble. 
that Dr. Wesley recently preached following the death of Congressman John Lewis. Inspired and let it challenge you. And please note that the opinions and views expressed by those of our guests do not necessarily reflect the views and the policies of United Lutheran Seminary. Let us receive the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley following the sermonic piano selection from Scott Cumberbatch. grace and peace be unto you from God, our Father and our Mother, and Jesus Christ, our resurrected, our risen, our reigning, and our eternal Redeemer. It's Pastor Howard John Wesley. I can't believe you've come back on tonight. How excited I am to be part of this worship as we celebrate 40 years of the Urban Theological Institute. Dr. Robertson, thank you again, not only for the opportunity to lecture on yesterday, but to share in this sermonic moment tonight. Listen, in the very turbulent and trying times we live, the Lord placed upon my heart a series that I preached in the life of our church just a few weeks ago called A Call to Duty. The sermon was rooted in the book of Esther. And within the sermon, I took time to walk through the different personalities in the book of Esther and how they model to us God's call and assignment on our lives to help save our people. The series began by looking at Vashti and how she says no. It then moved to Esther and how Esther's called to speak up for her people. Tonight, I want to share with you the third installment of the series, A Call to Duty. Having looked at Vashti, having examined Esther, this sermon focuses on Mordecai and what Mordecai's assignment is and how he models to us the call of God on our lives during this time when so many lives are in danger. The sermon was preached right around the time of the passing of the Honorable John Lewis 
and in honor of his life and legacy and contribution to the United States, the third part of this series is called Good Trouble. It is my prayer that it somehow embodies and models some of the things we talked about and lectured on yesterday, but even more so, that it's a blessing to your life and your ministry. So let's be in prayer and let's hear now what the Lord would say in this third part of a call to duty, looking at Mordecai. Let's get in some good trouble. God's name does not show up anywhere in the 10 chapters of Esther. No mention of God, no calling on God, no glory to God, no worship of God, no praise of God. And that is one of the things that also makes the book of Esther so disturbing. Because in a time when the people of God are under threat and their lives are in jeopardy, God is seemingly absent during their greatest need. But I come by to tell you that although the hand of God is not seen and the name of God is not called, the praises of God are not sung, and it seems like God is absent, the voice of God is clearly heard. Because in a time when it seems like God is not present, God is always at work. And what we've witnessed is the voice of God and the work of God showing up in the people of God who receive their assignment and their call of duty to be the voice and the presence of God in a time when people are in threat, are threatened and living in jeopardy. Likewise, I'll suggest to you in the lives in which we live that there are moments when God calls us to duty. There are moments when God expects us to be God's voice. There are moments when it may seem to others like God is absent and God chooses to show up through the work and the assignment that we are called to do. And what God desires, what God wants, what God needs are women and men who respond to that call the same way the prophet Isaiah did when his response to God was, here am I, send me. Here's the good news as we get into the sermon today. You don't have to know every scripture of the Bible. You don't have to know the third verse of all the hymns. You don't have to talk in tongues. In order to be used by God, all God requires is a heart that is available and open to their call of duty. I'm going to invite you to journey back with me now into the book of Esther. As I put together two passages of scripture in Esther, in the fourth chapter, beginning in verse number 12. And then I'd like you to hear the very last verse of the book of Esther in chapter 10, verse 3. Esther chapter 4, beginning in verse number 12. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer to her. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. If you would now hear the last verse of the book of Esther in chapter 10, verse 3. Mordecai, the Jew, was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews, and held high in esteem by his many fellow Jews because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of all the Jews. You know, I think I can say this without fear of contradiction. The 2020 has been a rough year. As a matter of fact, for many of us, we can say this is probably the roughest year we've ever experienced. This is not the year we dreamed about and hoped for and prayed for on New Year's Eve. This has been a year of unexpected rough realities. As a matter of fact, an appropriate slogan for 2020 is probably this. If it's not one thing, it's another. And part of what's made 2020 so difficult is that we seemingly are constantly surrounded by death. This year started off with the unexpected tragic death of Kobe Bryant that shook many of us to our core. We then had to deal with the unjust, violent killings 
of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor. We had to watch the killing and murder of George Floyd. And now every day when we turn on the news, we see the rising numbers of deaths surrounded with COVID-19. And if that were not enough, we now have recently lost the icons of racial justice in our land in Reverend C.T. Vivian and Representative John Lewis. John Lewis, who is arguably the most committed civil servant of our lifetime. If you are like me and hovering around the age of 50, we were not alive during the era of civil rights. We were not under the influence of Martin Luther King. But since then, I would argue with you that it is hard to name anyone who's done as much for civil and racial justice in the United States of America like John Lewis. John Lewis, a founding member of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. John Lewis, one of the organizers and presenters in the March on Washington. John Lewis, one of the original Freedom Riders. John Lewis, who gave his life and service and civil service to the United States, serving in Atlanta City Council and then almost three decades in the House of Representatives. John Lewis, who was such an advocate for the right of African Americans to vote, that he almost sacrificed his life on Bloody Sunday in 1965, crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge for our right to vote. The world has rarely seen anyone like John Lewis. And in this time, as we live in this era, and I seek to share with you a word and lesson from Mordecai, I want you to listen also to the Gospel of John. Not the Apostle John, but the Gospel of John Lewis. Hear what the Gospel of John Lewis, chapter 1, verse 2 says. Do not get lost in the sea of despair. Be hopeful. Be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or even a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. As a matter of fact, as we listen to the life of Mordecai and heed the gospel of John Lewis, today I want to talk, teach, and preach in this last segment of Call to Duty from the subject, Good Trouble. Good trouble. Representative John Lewis reminds us that every generation must answer the call to create a more fair and just society. And I suggest to you that at some point in your life, at some point in your journey as a Christian, the call of God for you is to make some noise. God's assignment for you is to get in some good trouble. You know what good trouble is. Good trouble is when you're criticized for leveling the playing field against the isms and systems that seek to oppress people. Good trouble is when you pay the price because you spoke truth to power. Good trouble is when you're attacked by people who are unrighteous because your godliness exposed them. Good trouble is when you lose connectivity with people because you dare to stand up for what is right. Good trouble is when they talk about you behind your back and call you names like stuck up because there are a lot of things you just won't do anymore. Good trouble is when people publicly stand against you because you've got some convictions that you refuse to compromise. Good trouble is when you get written up because you had the courage on your job to call and point out their racism, their privilege, and their microaggressive behavior. Good trouble is when you get banned from preaching in the National Baptist Convention because you dared call out their misogyny and their homophobia and called for inclusion in ministry of the LGBTQIA 
members of our society and called for equality of gender in ministry. Do me a favor, touch somebody and say, that's some good trouble. Good trouble is exactly what Mordecai finds himself in the midst of right here in the book of Esther. Remember Mordecai. Mordecai is a descendant of the exiles who were shipped away from Jerusalem into Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. And when the Persians conquered the Babylonians, Mordecai decides to stay in the Jewish diaspora and live in the capital city called Susa. Mordecai raises his cousin, whose Jewish name is Hadassah, but her Persian name is Esther. And you know by now, Esther becomes queen after Vashti. And if you would reread Esther chapter 1 to 10, you will find that there are three times that Mordecai speaks up. There are three instances where we see him accept a call to duty to use his voice and his presence to make a difference. I want to take some time this morning and slow down and walk you through those three instances because I think they speak volumes to us about God's call to duty on our lives. Let me share with you three times Mordecai finds himself in good trouble. Are you ready? Number one, Mordecai finds himself in good trouble when he refuses to bow to Haman. As a matter of fact, that's really what starts all the trouble for all the Jews. When you read in chapter 3, when Haman is elevated by Xerxes, Haman wants everybody to bow to him. Haman, who comes out of nowhere. Haman, who doesn't even have a college degree that we can verify. Haman, who had no business being in politics in the first place. Haman, whose own family and mama said that he would be dangerous as a politician. Haman gets elected. And all of a sudden, Haman wants everybody to bow to him. Haman wants everyone to say he's the greatest. Haman won't read anything where his name doesn't show up. Haman won't take any interview unless they're blowing smoke and sunshine in his face. Haman wants everyone to bow. And Mordecai says no. Mordecai refuses to bow before Haman. Now the question you ought to be asking right about here, why does Mordecai refuse to bow for Haman? The answer is really simple. Mordecai is a Jew, and he knows that his covenant with God prohibits him from bowing to any man. It's that same refusal that we see in the book of Daniel with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when the three Hebrew boys refuse to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar because these Jews know that if I bow down to any man, I am dishonoring my walk with God. And so Mordecai refuses to do anything that would dishonor his covenant walk with God. And his refusal to bow because of his covenant with God is what gets him in some good trouble. I came by to tell you early on in this sermon that every now and then you ought to find yourself in trouble because of your commitment to your walk with God. Every now and then you ought to upset some things because obeying God is critical to your life. Every now and then you ought to disturb some people and irritate them and get under their skin because God's been too good for you to you to just dishonor God to please someone else. I don't know who I came to preach to early on this weekend, but I want you to know something, that everyone should not feel comfortable around you. 
Everyone should not be at ease around you. Your faith in God, your walk with God, your commitment to God ought to irritate some people. The way you continuously talk about how good God has been to you ought to get on some people's nerves. Your list of things you won't do because you love the Lord and you are saved in the name of Jesus ought to cause you to get uninvited from some social events. Your walk with God, your righteousness, your covenant with God ought to make some people uncomfortable. And if everyone is comfortable around you, you may not be as committed to God as you testify you are. Let me say that again. If everyone is comfortable around you, if you don't irritate anybody, if you don't agitate anything, if you don't upset any system, if you don't disturb any person, you may not be as committed to God as you claim to be. I don't care how big your Bible is. I don't care how many scriptures you quote, how many tongues you talk in, how many worship services you subscribe to. If you don't irritate something or someone, you may not be as committed to God as you claim to be because everyone should not be comfortable around you. Mordecai makes Haman uncomfortable. And here's the good news. You'll like this, John. Mordecai makes Haman uncomfortable, but Mordecai never speaks to Haman. There's nowhere in the book of Esther where Mordecai speaks to Haman. He doesn't cuss him out. He doesn't yell at him. He doesn't call him out of his name. All he does is refuse to bow. And his refusal is what allows us to see the presence of God in the midst of Haman's plan. Beloved, I came by to tell you something to teach you from the life of Mordecai. You don't have to cuss folk out. You don't even have to open up your mouth. Sometimes the way you represent God is simply by your refusal to do some things. You don't have to go on your job and quote scripture and throw Bible at everybody. Just refuse to laugh at an inappropriate joke. You don't have to sing every hymn and walk into your office always singing praises. Just refuse to call someone out of their name. You don't have to talk in tongues every time you open up your mouth for people to know that you love the Lord. All you've got to do is refuse to fellowship in ways that dishonor your covenant with God. You don't have to carry a Bible and beat people over the head with scripture all day long. All you've got to do is refuse to live your life in a way that contradicts the goodness of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God in your life. Sometimes all you need to do is refuse to engage in certain behavior. And your refusal will get you into some good trouble. Mordecai gets into good trouble because he refuses to bow to Haman. Can I tell you the second way Mordecai gets into some good trouble? Read your Bible. Mordecai finds out that there are two eunuchs who work for Xerxes who are plotting to assassinate him. And when Mordecai finds out that there's a plan in place to kill Xerxes, when he finds out that there is a movement in the land to bring about death and destruction. When he's made aware that there's a system in place that's seeking to kill someone, he tells Esther. Esther tells Xerxes and makes certain that Xerxes knows the information came from Mordecai. Watch this. When Mordecai knows that there's a plan to bring death in the land, Mordecai says, I can't sit back and know that there's a systemic plan to bring death in this nation and I not say anything. I can't turn it off of the news. I can't watch it and just ignore it. I can't read about it and say it doesn't involve me that when I am aware that death is being plotted and when I know that death is being planned and when I know that killing is systemic, I cannot just sit by and not say something to help stop the killing that's about to happen in my own land. Mordecai says, when you know death is coming, you've got to say something. 
Now, 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 now this bothered me a little bit. This bothers me, Lauren, because I've got to wonder why does Mordecai say anything? The plot doesn't involve him. He has nothing to gain by revealing it. As a matter of fact, he can make some powerful enemies that cause him some trouble, that want to kill him. So why make some good trouble when you've got nothing to gain? Why make some noise when it might get you in trouble? Why get involved in something that doesn't involve you? Why raise your voice about something that really doesn't threaten you? Wouldn't it be easier to just keep quiet? Why does Mordecai make some noise that ultimately gets him in some trouble? Well, well, allow me to put out two ideas that have come in my spirit and, and maybe you can add to the list. Remember, the brothers who are seeking to kill Xerxes are eunuchs. Now, now you need to know in that day and age, eunuchs had one assignment. They guarded the queen. So if these two eunuchs succeed in killing Xerxes, who do you think will also be implicated in the plot to kill? Esther. The eunuchs guard Esther. And if the eunuchs bring about death, then Esther may suffer the consequence. And so could it be that Mordecai gets in some good trouble? Mordecai makes some noise. Mordecai doesn't just sit by because he realizes that even if I don't think this involves me, it will affect Esther, whom I love. It will affect Esther, who I've raised. It will affect Esther, who represents the generation of Jews who come after me. And if I don't do anything now, there's a generation that will come after me that will pay the price for my silence. They will suffer because we've been silent. Beloved, I came by to tell you in 2020 that the call of God on our life is to get in some good trouble, not simply because it affects us, but because there's a generation coming after us who will suffer if we are silent. I believe this with all of my heart, that if we miss this moment, there will be blood on our hands. If we sit silently, there's a generation that will suffer under a racist system that we could have challenged. If we don't do anything now, the legacy of this administration will affect generation after generation after generation that comes after us. We will have blood on our hands if we sit silently right here. So Mordecai says, I got to get in some good trouble because there's a generation that depends on me. Can I share with you another reason why I believe Mordecai speaks up even though it doesn't involve him? Remember, Mordecai was not an original exile. C come here. Mordecai was not born in Jerusalem. Mordecai's grandfather was and was exiled under Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. Mordecai is born after that. Mordecai is born in a time when the Jews are released from exile to go back to Jerusalem when the Persians conquered the Babylonians. Go and teach Bible, Pastor Wesley. When Darius, the first emperor of Persia, conquers the Babylonians, he releases the Jews from exile and they can go back home. But Mordecai and his family have chosen not to go back to Jerusalem. They live in the Jewish diaspora and have made their home in Susa. M don't miss this. Mordecai has deliberately chosen to make the Persian Empire his home. Susa is his land. This is his home that he has chosen to live in. And I would argue with you that one of the reasons Mordecai speaks up about the plan to kill Xerxes is that he knows if the emperor is killed, all heck will break out 
in the nation that I've chosen to live in. Beloved, could it be that by revealing the plot to kill Xerxes, Mordecai proves his patriotism. Mordecai proves his love of his nation. Because patriotism is not simply loyalty to your nation. Patriotism is a care and concern about the welfare of your land and all of its citizens. Let me say that again. Patriotism is not some blind allegiance to some political ideology. Patriotism is not standing on a street corner and saying that our land is better than your land. Patriotism is not proven by what you do or don't do when your national anthem is played. Patriotism is not hanging a flag on your porch and putting a Trump sign in your yard. Patriotism is not yelling at immigrants, telling them to go back to their home country. Patriotism is not saying this is our land when your ancestors were immigrants, your ancestors were colonizers, your ancestors were enslavers, your ancestors were thieves, your ancestors were murderers. That's not patriotism. Patriotism is when you see that your nation is not well and you decide to speak up and say something. Patriotism is when you refuse to watch it on the news and not march in the streets. Patriotism is when you raise your voice and believe that your nation can and should be better. Patriotism is when you're willing to risk your life and your job to see your nation become better. Patriotism is when you commit yourself to public service and you put caring for people above earning money. Patriotism is when you enact your right to petition your government for the redress of grievances without fear of repercussion. True patriotism is not seen in blind allegiance to a politic or a party or a president, but it's seen when you declare that this land can be better, must be better, should be better, and I have a divine assignment to use the voice God has given me to change the nation in which I live. Mordecai proves he's a patriot. Can I push it? Might as well. Watch what happens. When Xerxes the emperor finds out that Haman wants to kill the Jews, he really has no reason to stop the plan. One of the reasons he stops the plan is not only his love of Esther, watch this, but his memory of Mordecai. He knows he owes Mordecai for the stability of the nation. I came by to declare to the United States of America that you owe African Americans for the greatness of this land. You owe African Americans for not burning this place down. You owe African Americans for anything you claim to be great. It is indebted to our contribution and participation. And when Xerxes has to choose between Haman and Mordecai, he chooses Mordecai to let Mordecai know something. When you've contributed, you don't have to bow to Haman. When you are the reason the land is what it is, you don't have to cater to Haman's narcissism. You don't have to buy into Haman's lies. You don't have to fear repercussion from Haman. Stand in the boldness of what you know you've contributed to your nation and stop bowing to Haman. Brooke, I'm getting in a whole lot of trouble and the water's getting a whole lot hotter. Please don't shut off yet. Don't turn me off yet because it's about to get gooder. Mordecai doesn't bow to Haman, gets him in trouble. Mordecai speaks up about his nation, gets him in trouble. But here's the last trouble Haman gets in. Haman not only speaks up for God, and Haman not only challenges his nation, but Haman's most difficult assignment is to talk to Esther. Why is that difficult? 
Esther is his cousin. Esther, that's his people. And beloved, sometimes we've got to cause trouble with our own people. Sometimes we have to speak to our own Esthers. And one of the most difficult things you will ever have an assignment to do that will cause and create trouble in your life is when you have to challenge your own people. Go back to Esther chapter four, and here's the problem. You ready? Esther is so sheltered by her privilege in the palace, she doesn't even know what's happening to her people in the streets. She's reached such a place of privilege that she is ignorant of what's happening to her people and the threat that they live under. So when Mordecai shows up to Esther, the very first thing Mordecai has to say to Esther is this, do you know what's going on? Are you aware that your own people are threatened in their existence? Esther, do you know what's happening? You, you, you know what Mordecai does? Mordecai pulls a, a, a doughboy on Esther. Yeah, yeah, my generation, you know that? One of the most iconic films of our generation was produced by a brother named John Singleton, good brother Cap Alpha Psi, Turning Incorporated, who put out a movie in 1991 called, uh-huh, Boys in the Hood. And you remember Boys in the Hood, and in the very last scene of Boys in the Hood, Doughboy, played by Ice Cube, is speaking to Trey, played by Cuba Gooding, after the day and night Ricky was killed. Go on back, Pastor Wesley. Doughboy is talking to Trey about Ricky. And here's what Doughboy says in one of the most memorable lines of that film and that generation. Doughboy says, either they don't know, they won't show, or they don't care about what's happening in the ghetto. Ooh, listen to what Doughboy says. Either they don't know, they won't show, or they don't care about what's happening in the ghetto. Mordecai comes to Esther to make certain that I show you and you know what's happening so I can then ask you, do you care? Do you know what's happening to your people? Esther, do you know that your people are living under the threat of death? Esther, are you aware that your people are killed by over-policing and police brutality? Do you know your people are disproportionately incarcerated? Esther, do you know your schools for your people are underfunded, but over-resourced with school resource officers who are arresting your children and putting them in the prison pipeline? Do you know that those who killed your Breonna Taylor have yet to be arrested? Do you know that voter suppression for your people is on the rise? Do you know that the protection from evictions from COVID-19 is about to end and your people are going to lose their homes. Esther, do you know what's happening to your people? And the real question Mordecai asks that must be asked to Esther today, do you care? Do you care about what's happening to your people? Can I push this? Here's the problem with Esther. She's sheltered in the palace. She's protected by privilege. Esther has climbed herself out of the rough realities her people face every day. Esther has resources. Esther doesn't have to live in those neighborhoods. Esther, if she ever has children, they don't have to go to those schools. If Esther gets in trouble or her future children do, Esther's got enough money to buy a competent lawyer to navigate her children out of an unjust justice system. Esther is even cool with Haman. Watch this. Esther sits at the table with Xerxes. Esther 
plays golf with Haman. Esther is cool with the very brother who's trying to kill her people. And you know what? That angers Mordecai. Mordecai is angered to see Esther chilling with Haman. Now, listen, I know, I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, and you'll probably email me, and you have the right to disagree, but every now and then I got to let you know I get angry with Esther. I get angry when I see Esther wearing a red hat. I get angry when I hear Esther speaking out of ignorance of her own people's history. I get angry when I see Esther on social media talking about look how much Haman has done for us. I get angry when I see Esther accepting a photo op to go to the round table at the house so that Haman can prove he's got some Jewish friends. I get angry when I see Esther hanging with Haman. But one thing the Spirit of the Lord convicted me of and I press upon you, let us be cautious of turning on our own people even when it seems our own people have turned on us. Thank God for Esther. Somebody had to be in the palace. Someone had to be on the inside. Someone had to have Xerxes' ear. And the real word and challenge of Mordecai is simply this. I don't hate you, Esther, but Esther, don't let your personal privilege in the palace make you apathetic to the plight of your people. Let me say that again. Esther, I don't hate you, but don't allow your place of privilege in the palace to cause you to be apathetic to the plight of your people. Beloved, there is nothing evil or wrong about being black and Republican. There's nothing demonic about being Latinx and supporting this administration. But please, don't be ignorant or apathetic to what's happening to your people. Somewhere there's got to be a Mordecai who challenges Esther to care about her people. Clarence Thomas, care about your people. Daryl Scott, care about your people. Mark Burns, care about your people. Candace Owens, care about your people. The word of the Lord is, it's all right to be in the palace. It's all right to be privileged, but don't forget what's happening to your people outside of the palace. I got in trouble. Let me go on and wrap this sermon up. So Mordecai gets word to Esther. And listen very clearly at the three things Mordecai tells Esther. It's the same thing we've got to share today. He tells her, if you read verses 12 through 14, he said, listen, Esther, don't think that because you're in the palace, you will escape. Don't think that what's happening to your people doesn't affect you. Esther, you can't detach yourself from what's happening to your people. Watch this, because no amount of money, no degree on the wall, no title you bear will ever stop you from being part of your people. You are connected to your people. And what happens to them affects you. He says, Esther, don't think you're going to escape. And watch this. This gets deep. Bobby, Mordecai says, and if you don't do anything, deliverance will come from somewhere else. How is Mordecai certain that deliverance will come? Because Mordecai knows God is against Haman's plan. And so when Mordecai tells Esther that deliverance will come from somewhere else, this is what Mordecai is saying. Esther, you need to know God is at work. And the question Esther has to ask is where I'm standing where God is at work. Am I standing in the place 
where God is at work or am I against what God is up to? Esther, when you see where you stand and what you back and what you vote for, do you see God at work there? So when you see Karen throw her temper tantrum, do you see God? When you hear them call us the N-word, do you see God? When you see his knee on his neck, do you see God? When you see the military arresting people on U.S. soil, do you see God? Do you see God where you stand? The last word of Mordecai is this. He said, listen, you're connected to the fate of your people. Do you see God where you stand? And the last word is this. You can't keep quiet at a time like this. You can't keep quiet at a time like this. You can't keep quiet at a time like this. Lord, I thank you for the call of duty on our lives. Make me like Esther, bold and courageous to stand up and protect my people. Give me the spirit of Vashti to speak out for myself and then use the influence that you've given me to empower others to do the same. And God, may we like Mordecai and John Lewis get in some good trouble. This is our call to duty. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. And thank you. Thank you, Pastor Wesley, for that powerful sermon that we would say in church, did not our hearts burn while the man of God spoke to us by the wayside. Thank you for good trouble. Again, I invite you to join us on Friday evening, 7 p.m. for our 40 by 40 piano concert with Maestro Scott Cumberbatch. Feel free to make a donation to support the chair in African American Studies here at United Lutheran Seminary. Again, you can mail a check payable to United Lutheran Seminary to the attention of the UTI office at 7301 Germantown Avenue, Philadelphia, PA, 19119. Or you can give online at uls.edu backward slash give. And there you will see the Jeremiah A. Wright Endowed Chair. Please select that. Or you can text a gift. And so, as we sign off for this evening, we look forward to being with you on Friday evening as we celebrate in concert with Scott Cumberbatch. Come back. Look forward to seeing you on Friday. 